Anyone who's ever questioned any aspect of the gender ideology out loud, on social media or in real life, is immediately called a bigot, a transphobe, or accused of wanting trans people erased from the world. Despite the overblown rhetoric, this is problematic behaviour in several different ways, and known as bigoteering. Firstly, it's manipulation, pure and simple. It's an attempt to silence people by exploiting the social stigmas around transphobia and bigotry, with the accuser attempting to gain the upper hand in terms of virtuous behaviour, forcing those accused to spend time and energy to explain why they're not a bigot or a transphobe. It's also intellectually lazy, as trans rights activists use it to end any debate or discussion they know they cannot answer adequately. Calling someone a bigot or a transphobe and then refusing to continue a conversation isn't the greatest way to win friends and influence people, and shows the insecurity they have in their own position. It means that trans rights activists don't have to understand or deal with the nature of the problem they're causing. But most importantly, it dilutes actual transphobia and bigotry. This is a huge issue, as there are genuinely hateful, transphobic people in the world spreading vile abuse towards trans people. By calling everything else bigoted or transphobic, the true victims of hatred are the ones being insulted. It almost gives a free pass to those who are actually transphobic too, who can then hide behind the excuse, well, everything is transphobic these days. There are perhaps a few reasons why gender ideology has grown so quickly as a movement, and why trans rights activists have so much support. One is what we call the sneak. The fact that trans rights is a term in itself, and that supporters of the ideology call themselves activists, might suggest that the ideology is a good thing. After all, activists and people fighting for their rights have historically been seen as well-meaning and virtuous, but this isn't really the case here. The claim that gender ideology is a civil rights issue has painted the movement to be something it is not. Gender ideology and queer theory have piggybacked on a lot of the LGB rights movement, as we've discussed. Stonewall, for example, has moved from an LGB rights organisation to one that is more distinctly trans, as can be seen clearly by the comparison of the words lesbians and trans in their literature over time. The sneak is the phrasing and naming of the movement as a rights issue, when it appears to be much more complex and political. The same can be said to some extent of the Black Lives Matter movement. Not the sentiment itself, obviously, which is unarguable, as of course black lives do matter greatly, but the organisation behind the movement, which among other things has been accused of anti-Semitism for their pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli stance, a stance which seems more suited to the Lebanese civil war than a movement about police brutality against black people in America and other countries. But because anyone who says, I don't agree with Black Lives Matter, meaning the organisation rather than the sentiment, will be accused of racism, the organisation looks to the outside world as a just, virtuous and well-meaning civil rights group, rather than an authoritarian left political group. If you don't think this is the case, look at the treatment of black people who disagree with the Black Lives Matter movement's stance. They face being criticised and abused by the most vocal BLM activists, many of whom are not black. No, you're white! You know, you're not black on the inside! I'm more black than you on the inside at this particular point. Yeah. There were people during the times of slavery who enabled the slavers. We've reached a situation where a white person can abuse a black person under the guise of a pro-black civil rights movement and the white person will receive support. The same is identically true of the trans rights movement. Anyone expressing disagreement with the trans rights activists, no matter how abusive they may be, will be called transphobic, accused of wanting trans people dead, face having their personal details revealed, lose their jobs or be violently attacked in real life. Again, all under the guise of a well-meaning civil rights movement. This means that gender-critical trans people, such as Debbie Hayton, Miranda Yardley, Buck Angel and others, have all been targeted. This has meant that trans people have been abused by non-trans men under the banner of pro-trans civil rights. And all of this is supported and cheered on by celebrities, politicians, political activists and others. We're really through the looking glass in terms of how a society should behave. Normally you engage with arguments, you don't talk about character or motivations, you don't try and say that somebody's evil or, you know, all that. Plus, there have been public protests about me on campus, at the Student Union, there's been stuff in the Argus about me, so it's all coming down. And the aim is to make me feel ashamed, as far as I can see, and, that, and, and also to socially isolate me from potential supporters so that they don't get dragged into this media, frenzy, whatever. And the ultimate aim is to get me to stop talking. Um, 
So generalizing from my own case, social shaming seems to me the way that operates in this debate. You're told you're evil, you're told you're confused, you don't know enough, you're not kind, um, you're causing harm. And that's meant to get us to shut up. And it's particularly aimed at females because we are <laughs> susceptible, allegedly, to this feeling of shame. So people will use this more disproportionately on females than males. But in my case, it hasn't worked. 